Welcome back, everybody. This is Dr. Tom Lewis with the Business of Medicine, and I'm alongside my, my co-host, Rick Brody. Dr. Tom, how are you today? I'm doing very well, Rick. How are you? Good, and there's another doctor in the house, so I'm feeling really good. Yes, well, the Business of Medicine, what's better than having a champion of the new theories on disease, Dr. Kilmer McCulley. Hey, Dr. McCulley, how are you today? I'm great. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, we, I understand there's a book coming out in the first quarter, but uh, we're going to have you back when that's ready to go. But what is it about? The book is about my life work, which is the, I'm the pioneer of the homocysteine theory. This is a theory I discovered uh, many years ago when after I'd finished my training as a pathologist at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, I encountered um, several patients with a, a new disease called homocysteinuria in which this abnormal metabolism of the amino acid homocysteine resulted in vascular disease. Mm. And the first patient was an eight-year-old boy who died of a stroke. And he was originally uh, published as an article in the New England Journal in 1933. And the pediatricians discovered that this disease that, uh, that this boy had was related to the disease they found in what his niece and that was studied in, 19, in the 1960s. So I restudied this old case, and um, <clears throat> it showed that this child developed arteriosclerosis, or thickening of the arteries, of the carotid arteries in his neck. And this uh, developed thrombosis, or occlusion by blood clots, causing a stroke in this eight-year-old boy. So I restudied this case, and I <clears throat> confirmed what the pathologist in the 1930s had shown, is that there was arteriosclerosis, or hardening of the arteries, in this boy who had caused this uh, stroke. And then later, I have encountered another child, two months of age, who had a different type of homocysteinuria. And this child uh, <clears throat> was had failure to thrive and had pneumonia. And uh, despite therapy, he was, uh, he, the patient uh, died and um, an autopsy was done. So I restudied this second case. And th these two cases are two of the first cases in the world literature of these rare diseases involving homocysteine metabolism. So as a result of this, I propose this theory that homocysteine is part of the process of arteriosclerosis in the general population. Sounds but, like the cold case files of medicine, Tom. No, but it's even more interesting than that because Dr. McCauley, since then, um, homocysteine is, especially recently, has gotten a lot more publicity and improper uh, homocysteine metabolism uh, as a root cause of not just cardiovascular disease, but involved in many, many other diseases. So you're almost like uh, Albert Einstein going after a unified field theory. You sort of have a unified disease theory, if I might say, on uh, it. So it's not just cardiovascular disease. That's correct. And uh, these diseases that you're mentioning, including some of the most important diseases of the population, like cancer and heart disease, are associated with aging. And of course, the aging process involves abnormal homocysteine metabolism. So all of these diseases are tied together. They're probably more than 200 diseases and conditions that have been related to abnormal homocysteine metabolism. So over these years, since I made this discovery over 40 years ago, I've been developing a theory as to how uh, cellular uh, metabolism and how the nutrients in the diet and how other factors, genetic factors, all contribute to the uh, genesis of these diseases of aging. Now, in, in the general population, do you consider nutrition a more important aspect than genetics? Or how would you, how would you consider those two? Because a lot of people think their fate is sealed by their genetics. The genetics... Uh, gives you your background. This is your inheritance from your parents, mm -hmm. the way your body works. But the way you use food and the quality of the food from the d diet interacts with your genetic machinery of the body. And if, if your um, genetic machinery is abnormal, as it is in about 12% of the population, your homocysteine is very dependent on folic acid, a nutrient in the body. So you have an interaction between 
the, the diet and nutrition and also your genetic endowment that you get from your parents. It's all and tied in together. It's all tied together. Well, the, the B vitamins have become very well known as being important. Pregnant women are always recommended to make sure that their folic acid levels are up. But if I want to do um, take a preventative program, I haven't had my homocysteine measured, but let's assume I'm concerned it might be out of whack. What would a prescription be to kind of control my chronic disease uh, potential, if you well, will. Well, I think the basic, the best prescription is to improve the quality of your diet. Mm -hmm. my, my view is that uh, a freshly prepared whole foods uh, that are minimally processed or minimally uh, preserved are the best for you. And um, the highly processed foods, for example, oils and sugar, and flour are, have been shown many years ago to be deficient in these B vitamins, especially folic acid, which you mentioned, but also uh, vitamin B6 or pyridoxine and uh, vitamin B12 and also minerals. So the more processed the food is, the more these micronutrients or these uh, essential elements of the diet are lost. So if you eat a diet that consists of, uh, say, five to nine servings of fresh vegetables, or fruits per day, and uh, servings of uh, fresh meats or seafood or dairy foods, like eggs that are fresh. Uh, this will give you, uh, and also whole grains, um, mm -hmm. whole grains that are minimally processed. Uh, this will give you the basis for your for good nutrition that uh, will interact with your genetic endowment to produce the uh, uh, a healthy lifestyle. Geez, i got to go show up and after this interview. Well, well, Rick, that brings up a good point because a colleague of ours, uh, Sergio Garcia, who Dr. McCulley just met, taught me something very simple. You want to keep it simple when you're dealing with the general public because there's so many fads and concepts out there. It gets to be alphabet soup and very confusing. And he says, when you step into the grocery store, turn right, go as far as you can, then turn left, go as far as you can, left, left, then out and exit. So you, you shop around the exterior of the grocery store because that's where all the fruits, vegetables, and fresh fresh products are. And avoid the, the middle aisles where all the processed foods are. That's right. It's, it's good, good advice. It's Doc, excellent advice. <laughs> now, while we're waiting for your book to come out, this sounds fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Well, uh, I'm actually a farm boy from uh, born in Nebraska and raised in Colorado. And um, I uh, went to Harvard College and Harvard Medical School and got interested in research uh, while I was in college. Actually, I actually was interested in research and biochemistry and chemistry when I was a child. But uh, by my contacts and experiences at, at Harvard Medical School and my, after my residency in pathology at Massachusetts General Hospital, I uh, became interested in um, heart disease and cancer and had the opportunity to study with some really famous scientists, uh, especially um, Conrad Bloch, who was a Nobel Prize winner for cholesterol biosynthesis, also worked in the laboratory of James Watson, of the Watson and Crick wow. fame, mm -hmm. and um, Paul Zamasnik, who's a world-famous uh, researcher in protein synthesis. So. By by these contacts, I was able to position myself to do my life's work, which was trying to use uh, chemistry and biochemistry to understand the cause of diseases. And this is what I've done. That's a fantastic uh, career path. Now, one thing I just have to mention, because it's a, um, a passion of mine, is is cholesterol, the whole cholesterol theory of atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease. And you've put forth a very interesting review paper in the last few years that puts an entirely different spin on the whole cholesterol theory. Well, the cholesterol theory is over 100 years old, and um, it's, of course, controversial. And it's been known by doctors and scientists for many years that cholesterol is somehow involved in the process of arteriosclerosis. But exactly how has not been very clear. But my colleague uh, Ufe Ravenskoff and I proposed a, a new um, hypothesis as to how uh, cholesterol and lipoproteins are involved in the production of the vulnerable plaque in arteries. And basically the idea 
is that um, when you are exposed to microorganisms and microbes like viruses, uh, bacteria, uh, protozoans, and other microorganisms, these are complexed by lipoproteins. Lipoproteins like LDL and HDL in the mm -hmm. blood complex with these microbes, and they form aggregates. And this has been well described by many scientists over the past 60 or 70 years. But what we've proposed is that these aggregates uh, uh, are formed with homocysteine and LDL to form, to obstruct the small blood vessels that feed the artery wall. And because of this obstruction, the blood flow is inhibited to the wall of the artery, and it actually dies. And that these uh, uh, aggregates of microorganisms and lipids then rupture into the lining of the artery to produce a vulnerable plaque. Hmm. So this is our theory. And um, vulnerable plaques are extremely important because when they rupture, they cause thrombosis of an artery and give you a heart attack or a stroke or lead to uh, um, gangrene of the extremities, for example, in diabetes. Now, wow. can I interpret what you said for the layperson who um, may not have picked up the entire message? But what you're saying is cholesterol is really part of our immune defense against, for example, bacteria and other pathogens that are attacking us, our vessels, and our systems. And so actually cholesterol, even though it may cause some deleterious effects, is actually a very, very important part of our health. Exactly. Cholesterol is present in L every cell of the body. It's part of every cell membrane in your body. So it's absolutely necessary for new cells when they're produced. But... Um, in addition, um, the lipoproteins which carry cholesterol in the blood, these LDL, low-density lipoprotein, mm -hmm. and high-density lipoprotein, um, bind to microorganisms because the microorganisms have fat in their cell wall, and they bind together and form aggregates. And it's been shown by many different investigators that this process, which is like an innate immune process, inactivates right. these microorganisms and protects you against infections. Wow. Right. Well, I have a recommendation for Rick, although it's not exactly true because it's been shown that cholesterol intake in the diet is not correlated to your cholesterol levels. But I was going to say, Rick, the take-home lesson is we can go to go out and get a good pint of Ben and Jerry's and enjoy it tonight. All right, let's go, Tom, because I think we, uh, we're we getting the signal from Rob, our producer. So, uh, Very good. Can we have you come back, Dr. McCulley, because this is we just touched the surface on a lot of things. I'd be, I'd be delighted to be, come back. I want to discuss my new book, The Abs Pioneer of the Homocysteine Theory. Absolutely. We'd love to have you back. This is Dr. Tom Lewis with the Business of Medicine on the UR Business Radio Network.